and i want happy new year to all our viewers let this year bring more fortunes and success to you all today we have dr balaji chinnasamy sir our patron and pediatric professor to start this year with a great academic session from a very basic topic history taking an examination in pediatrics for undergraduate this is a part of pediatrics rapid revision series and today we have him here thank you sir for joining with us in this in this new year let us hand over the session to him thank you sir thank you raghu thank you and uh, happy new year to all of you and uh, today we will start our first uh, part of the rapid uh, revision series general history taking and examination format and i have with me dr gayatri priyadarshini ma'am she is also faculty in uh, pediatrics so um, so uh, we are planning it as a rapid revision series the main target is to uh, pass the exams i am not uh, aiming for you all to get uh, the best of the score i want you all basically to pass the exams so i am keeping it as a rapid revision uh, series and uh, we will be starting our rapid revision series from january 16th every saturday and uh, six live classes and depending upon how we finish even more also we will be planning so the main aim is uh, each case we will be discussing in a short period in around 30 minutes not more than that most of the channels you have around 1 hour 1 and 1/2 hours so we want you to revise all these just prior to your exams so that is the main aim of this uh, uh, whole rapid revision series so we are planning around 6 plus live classes it will be not more than 6 uh, to 8 hours total so that the day before your exams you will be able to revise it very well so that's the main aim of it and uh, Uh, the registration we have kept it a very nominal fees two fifty and you can register yourself uh, by clicking this link www dot tiny url dot com slash peets revision so www dot tiny url dot com slash peets revision uh, if you have any issues you can contact me with uh, this uh, phone number uh, WhatsApp me I will help you out. Uh, let's move on uh, without wasting time to the first part of this uh, series uh gayatri ma'am uh, yes sir. i will hand over oh. to you and in okay. between uh, me and gayatri ma'am will be shuffling uh, on the topics so that you get a bit of variety in the speech thank you ma'am thank you okay good evening all happy new year first of all and uh, this will be a complete case format and you will be knowing how to complete it uh, to, throughout like uh, for the case uh, case sheet how will be the case sheet format and what all the thing that you have to remember so first we'll start with demographic thing which is very essential for uh, but we take it for the name sake but what is the use of that has to be uh, known to you all so let's start with first the name name should be in full name and identity of the uh, ip number or so and so is there can be taken for them okay and this is just because to know the identity we have the we, with the same name we have two or three person so complete name should be there another thing age for the age it is actually the uh, why, why we are knowing the age is first thing is like uh, we can rule out which uh, disease comes in which group of age and which disease comes in later group of age so early earlier age we we see all the congenital heart disease all those things whereas in the later adolescent age we get uh, we get all the vascular diseases so with the age we can delineate that another thing next is sex and uh, me so to know the identity first another thing gender specific diseases are also again uh, can be delineated with the identification of the sex for example females are uh, more prone for uh, all these vascular diseases so with that we can have all the things okay next is uh, the place so place of the disease actually if uh, in our place it's very endemic so we keep that as the first 
we have the tuberculosis always in case of first dd in many many of the chronic uh, respiratory illnesses in ca in case of uh, foreign it's not the case it could be some other thing like uh, it could be cystic fibrosis or bronchiectasis or anything else uh, rather than keeping the tuberculosis as the first diagnosis so place uh, the uh, importance of pace is this another thing in case of uh, pd uh, in case of congenital heart disease we have this pda which is very common in the hilly areas so with that we we can keep in the mind that the ch child may be having this kind of disease at the first time. Uh, uh, next, next we have this informant. Informant is uh, whether the mother is the informant or somebody else is the informant. So that the whole history, what we are going to get from the person is reliable or not can be judged. If the mother, we can say it's good reliability, okay? Because no, um, the child will be better known by the mother rather than anybody else. If for example, if the child is being in a guardian of somebody else like grandmother or grandparents, then their reliability will be good than that of the mother. So this kind of uh, what, what I'm going to speak in the complete history in the forthcoming will be uh, reliable or not, whether I can trust or not can be dealt with this informant. Um, so we are getting on to the first, uh, that is chief complaint. So first and foremost is that the chief complaint should be in a chronological order. Another is that it should be in a patient's own words. So in case of chronological error, what happens is that the first uh, illness which arrived at the first should be mentioned first. For example, if the child is having fever, vomiting, loose stools. So fever for 10 days and vomiting and loose stools for two days or uh, one day. Then fever will be set first and then comes to, so, which is uh, next. Like for example, uh, loose stool for two days and then vomiting from yesterday should be presented in that way and uh, it should always be in a patient's own words so for example if the child is having breathlessness we should not say it as a chief complaint as the child is having breathlessness since two days it should be mentioned as fast breathing so it should be in a layman's term whatever the parent says should be taken care so next slide okay ma'am so thank you for the initial introduction. So coming to the history of presenting complaints. <coughs> so then uh, the complaints which you have written, you have to elaborate them. So have a specific template. Do not remember separate templates for each and every complaint. It's very difficult to remember. Have a set pattern which you can use it for all the complaints. So it starts with duration of the complaint. How is the onset, whether it is insidious or past and onset site where where exactly is the complaint what is the severity of the problem and how will you define what is the characteristic of the problem are there any aggravating factors are there any relieving factors how frequent is the problem uh, are there associated factors it is this associated factors which will help you out in uh, differentiating the problems for example fever fever associated with cough will put it into the RS system. Fever associated with seizures will go to the CNS system. So the associated factors will help you in pinning down the diagnosis. And is there any diurnal variation? So asthma is a nocturnal cough. So like the diurnal variation, postural variation. So the pitting edema is dependent edema. You will have the edema in the legs. So what is the postural variation? And finally, how is the progression? Is the problem improving or is it worsening or is it static? And for some complaints, you need to ask related to the content and color. For example, if it is a vomitus or if it is a loose tool, you have to know the content and color. Let me elaborate one example. Generalize the swelling for the past five days. So how are we going to elaborate it? Onset, the swelling has been insidious in onset. Site, it is in the periorbital region, which suggests more of a renal origin. So the periorbital region, site. Severity, how severe is the edema? Is it uh, having uh, edema so much that it is causing breathlessness? Is the edema so much that there is crotal edema? So that suggests the severity. And what is the characteristic? Is it a uh, pitting type of edema? Okay. What is the exact characteristic? So if it is abdominal pain, is it a colicky type of abdominal pain? Okay. Or is it a pricking type of abdominal pain? So what is the characteristic in it? And what are the exact aggravating factors and relieving factors? For example, in nephrotic, the URI triggers the edema. Okay, so what is the aggravating factor? It could be medications that relieves the problem. Similarly, aggravating factor, 
exertion so the breathlessness gets uh, aggravated by exertion typically in heart diseases okay so what is the aggravating factor what is the relieving factor and you can ask about the frequency especially for complaints like seizures and cough you need to know how frequent it has been occurring so what what is the frequency of the problem and associated factors uh, if what is associated with the edema is the decreased urine output associated with the edema probably you are dealing with some renal okay is there breathlessness associated with this edema probably you are dealing with some cardiac problem okay so the associated factors will uh, help to pin down the system which you are going to deal with okay and diurnal variation the especially early morning puffiness so nephrotic uh, renal it's going to be early morning so early morning puffiness and postural variation is there any uh, dependent edema so that is a postural variation so legs you will have the edema so uh, when the prolonged standing whole day uh, the child starts getting edema in the legs okay so postural variation and uh, for a less than one year old child it becomes the sacral edema so the dependent part so what is the postural variation and whether it is improving or is it worsening okay so this is the history of presenting complaints and also in the presenting complaints not only the positive complaints you have to take the negative history okay negative history uh, you cannot haphazardly ask anything in your mind you should have a differential diagnosis in mind and ask questions meaningfully to rule out that differential diagnosis so that should be your aim do not ask uh, any question which you have it in mind for example edema you have a renal so try to ask questions to rule out a cardiac cause of the edema try to ask questions to rule out hepatic cause of the edema try to rule out malabsorption try to rule out allergy so that's what we have doing the all the negative history which you are asking is trying to rule out the cardiac cause trying to rule out the hepatic cause so have a differential diagnosis in mind do not haphazardly ask questions ask questions to meaningfully eliminate that differential diagnosis similarly uh, ask questions negative questions related to some complications okay you might ask questions related to complications of the particular problem or related to some atypical presentations where the treatment will be entirely different so you need to ask questions for example in nephrotic uh, whether it is minimal change nephrotic or something else because treatment is going to be entirely different for minimal change steroids it's going to respond if it is going to be something else uh, any other uh, significant change nephrotic so treatment is going to be different so ask questions related to that uh, whether it could be sle hepatitis b so ask questions related to that whether it could be some secondary cause of nephrotic syndrome so some atypical presentations ask questions related to that ask questions related to the complications for example you have bacterial peritonitis and nephrotic so ask questions related to that so the negative history is not uh, uh, a random questions it should be specific to your differential diagnosis specific to rule out any complications or any atypical presentations which may change your management okay so i hand over to ma'am past is to now we can go for the past history so as far as the past past history is concerned we'll be dealing with two things that is episodes of the similar illness whether occurred in the past or something that is related uh, illness that has occurred in the past for example in the case of nephrotic we count about the episodes because whether it's the first episode or it has been occurred already so if that child has had the attacks already then we will be asking about what how many attacks and what kind of treatment whether it's steroid responsive or not depending upon which our treatment management is going to change so in the case of nephritic we don't have this kind of questions so we'll be asking something related illness in the past that is like some kind of throat infection or pyoderma which has occurred already so which which acts as a aggravating factor for the nephritic okay so another example that can be dealt here is that any number of episodes or whatever the treatment taken for example in the case of asthmatic or wheezing child so we will be asking about the night symptoms and how many episodes has occurred in the past one month or whatever or in the case of convulsion how many episodes whether the drug compliance is there or not has to be taken again so uh, these are the things that uh, completely we are ruling out another thing very important we have to ask all these questions that is any kind of recurrent respiratory tract infection uti or diarrhea it, this is because i'm 
I should know that I am not dealing with a malnourished or ma uh, immunocompromised child. So, if in these cases, the child is going to subject to have a recurrent RTI, UTI, or diarrhea. Next question that we have to include is the tuberculosis and any vaccine preventable disease. And in case of tuberculosis, whether the treatment taken or not has to be uh, inquired uh, precisely. And in case of vaccine preventable disease, maybe the illness could be a consequence or sequelae of the vaccine preventable disease. For example, in the case of in the last week and the child will be presenting with a diarrhea or pneumonia now. As well, or whether it's a sequelae of the uh, disease illness as such. Okay. Next, uh, other example include, for example, thalassemia. Uh, in case of thalassemia, we'll be asking the blood transfusion history, how many times the uh, child had already transfused and what was the pre-hemoglobin and then post-hemoglobin to know the status of the child. And uh, for the CNS, when, uh, when we are going on to CNS, that comes the last episode of the convulsion and we have to inquire about the drug compliance. When did they lastly, uh, like dose was corrected for the appropriate age or not, has to be checked. And most common is that they leave the drug commonly and they will have the convulsion. So this has to be taken. Last but not least, we'll be asking about the contact history, contact to the tuberculosis or any other illness, okay? So we can go for the next slide. It's okay. So after the past history is over, we are moving on to the antenatal history. Uh, we need to know how much detail we should be giving up. It depends on the ca case, case scenario. If it is a newborn, definitely antenatal history is very important. You have to go in full detail. If it is a cerebral palsy, you know that antenatal events could have caused the cerebral palsy. Then you have to be in detail. But uh, your case scenario is something like pneumonia, a 10-year-old child with pneumonia. There's not much relevance in the antenatal history. Just uh, say what was the para, what was the live, what was the abortion status, whether uh, good care was given, that is booked or not, and everything went eventful or uneventful. So that much is enough. You can be short depending upon the case scenario. But if it is a CP child or a newborn, the antenatal has to be in detail. So divide them. Uh, it's always very easy to be haphazardly presenting. Suddenly you come from first trimester, go back to third trimester, come back to second trimester. So that order, you should have an order when you are presenting. That's what I always say. You should have an order while you are presenting. Start with first trimester, then go to second trimester, then go to third trimester. Uh, remember what all events are important in first trimester. Uh, you need to know whether uh, what is the para live and abortion status of the mother, whether it, uh, pregnancy is a registered or booked case. Okay, usually at least you should have four visits to say it as a booked or a registered case. Make sure whether folic acid was supplemented. Ideally, it should be uh, even before the conception, the folic acid supplementation. So make sure folic acid supplementation is given or not. They will ask you what, why is it important, neural tube defects in, and how was the conception, whether it was uh, a spontaneous conception or any artificial uh, means of uh, reproduction was uh, utilized. Okay, uh, but most important I would say is uh, first semester is the period of organogenesis. So anything that insults is a potential teratogen. So as for the torch infection history, fever with rash and lymphadenopathy, ask for history of radiation, ask for history of any drug intake. Any drug intake is a potential teratogen. Okay. So they might ask you about uh, uh, what are the drugs which can cause teratogenicity. So you need to have two or three drugs about the teratogenicity. Okay. Especially the anticonvulsants, remember the, about the teratogenicity. Then at the end of the first trimester, you do the nuchal translucency scan for uh, as a marker for Down syndrome and other uh, chromosomal disorders. And coming to the second trimester, you ask whether two doses of tetanus toxide was given and whether iron was added to the folic acid supplementation and quickening movements are started to feel at the second trimester. So whether they are uh, felt normally or whether they were less, less means it's obviously fetal distress. And most of the pregnancy related complications starts from the second trimester, be it uh, pregnancy induced hyperclerics, uh, pregnancy induced hypertension, be it gestational diabetes mellitus or uh, oligohydramnase and polyhydramnase. So everything starts mostly from the second trimester. 
and uh, your triple screening is done in the second trimester so ask for that if they know uh, just document it and uh, the most important anomaly scan is done at 20 weeks okay and in the third trimester uh, further most of the pregnancy related complications also occur in third trimester in fact it can worsen you don't take care of pah it goes into eclampsia okay so it can worsen in the third trimester so ask for that ask for any history of decreased fetal movements what was the total pregnancy weight gain okay so what was the total pregnancy weight gain and most important in the third trimester is infections infections in the mother especially at the last two weeks can affect the baby okay so fever with lower abdominal pain suggestive of chorioamnionitis cold smelling liquor burning micturition suggestive of uti leaking pv suggestive of infection can cause infection and prolonged rupture of membranes more than 24 hours so all this history suggest that there is infection to the mother which is going to get transmitted to the baby okay so uh, so the early onset sepsis for the baby is uh, is almost related to this history so ask this history in the third trimester and we always do the growth scan regularly to monitor the growth of the baby in the third trimester so antenatal history you divide it into three components how much in detail depends upon what case you are being given cerebral palsy it has to be detailed newborn it has to be detailed for others you can go a bit uh, on the easier side okay okay now. let me continue with the birth history now for the birth history you will be writing these congruent in case of cerebral palsy you need to have a some some more detail about that so usually in any case we will be giving the birth order whether it's a first child or second child and is that single born child or twin born child next is gestational week that is whether it's a term or uh, preterm at least okay and mode of delivery in the case of normal delivery or the lower cesarean lo lower uh, cesarean section uh, for the place of delivery whether it's a hospital based or the home based okay next is the birth weight for the birth weight is whether it's a low birth weight or uh, like large for gestational age can be given in that uh and you can just give the weight of the child and uh, we'll be knowing what is it and whether the child cried immediately after birth it's very important especially for the uh, cns cases where we are uh, more exposed to the cp cases and we have to tell that whether the child cried immediately after the birth or if not cried what are the kind of resuscitation taken okay and the breastfeeding whether it's initiated uh, early or after a few days or something whatever whatever the mother says can be taken here now coming on to the postnatal history which is extremely important in the case of cp child for example in the, uh, they may have a neonatal convulsion or neonatal jaundice and stay in nicu which has to be elaborated very well whether the oral feeds are taken at what day it has to it has it was being taken and uh, whether any kind of neonatal convulsion happened during the stay or any neonatal sepsis happened during the stay or any intervention for example intubation done or umbilical line done all those things has to be elaborated if it is a normal case you can just say whether uh, that no history of neonatal convulsion no history of uh, seizure sorry jaundice or no nicu stay so the child was well doing well and the started breastfeeding immediately that will do uh, well whereas in the case of cerebral palsy you need to elaborate a bit okay and now coming on to the family history uh, in family history age of the mother has to be uh, uh, insisted and then consanguinity which is very important whether it's a, cons a non consanguinous or consanguinous if it is a consanguinous the grading of the consanguinous has to be told here and family tree a small family tree that depicts the grandparents from the grandparents to the child we are dealing with has to be uh, given here and in the family family history we need to give if there is any significant illness is there or not for example in the case of congenital heart disease uh, or in case of thalassemia will be having any congenital anomaly present in the family members or not and in case of thalassemia whether anybody is also exposed or not okay now coming to the diet history so for the diet history we can uh, actually uh, differentiate the pediatric age as like less than 2 years and more than 2 years actually below 2 years we will be dealing we will be having more history about the breastfeeding formula feeding how about the complementary feeding all those things 
okay when whereas after 2 to 3 years we can will be concerned more about the what kind of food they are taking whether the protein rich food is being taken or not and junk taken or not okay so in the case of diet history so the, this way we can we have to uh, separate and we can uh, share the diet history uh, that, that can be like uh, it can be a precise in the case of uh, an older child for example in the case of 8 year old child the breastfeeding history can be very precise uh, whether the breast, breastfed till what months of age and then wh uh, what was the complementary feed and now the child is on vegetarian food or non vegetarian food and how about the junk item whatever they are taking and elaborate 24 hour recall method to be taken for the calorie and the protein intake so what is the protein intake and what is the calorie intake of the child has to be found and then in the especially this is very important in the case of sam child or a cp child where we are any congenital heart disease where they are going to have a growth failure so in these cases we will be calculating the calorie and the protein intake and then we will be calculating the expected calorie intake and expected protein intake for the expected weight of the child. And we'll be minusing, uh, subtracting the expected to the whatever the child is observed uh, calorie intake. And we'll be getting the deficit, calorie deficit and the protein deficit. So this kind of deficit we have to keep in mind when we are giving the management, we'll be increasing the calorie of the child. So if it is a child less than one year or so will be dealing more about the breastfeeding and the formula feeding whether the child is breastfed or formula fed and uh, what kind of formula the child is having whether it's a soy based formula or the uh, or uh, it's a normal formula whatever we are using next coming on to the immunization history the very important thing is that you need to know the uh, national um, immunization program schedule okay or universal immunization program schedule. So you have to know and um, age appropriately, you need to inquire whether this was the last uh, immunization uh, the child has received or not. So you can then you can say yes, immunized up to date as per universal immunization schedule. Another important thing that you have to notice here is the BCG scar. BCG scar, whether it's seen or not, has to be mentioned in each and every cases. Next, we are going for the treatment history. As far as the treatment history is concerned, this is mainly concerned for the chronic illness. So where we have this uh, asthma or any kind of anti, uh, sorry, convulsive disorder or seizure disorder, the child is on uh, having a uh, longer course of duration and the child, whatever the drug they are taking or what is the dose they are taking and is there any missed dose or not, all those things has to be elaborated in treatment history. Okay, so after finishing, uh, we will be ending up with very important history, the developmental history. This also depends upon uh, the case which we are dealing with. Cerebral palsy is developmental history. So developmental history has to be in detail and uh, sometimes that might be the presenting complaint. So you may have to say the developmental history in the presenting complaint, in the elaboration of the presenting complaint itself, you have to say, Sir, the presenting complaints is development. So I would like to elaborate the developmental history here itself. So that's how you have to do it. And uh, it has to be in detail. But for a seven-year-old child where pneumonia is the problem, the child is doing well. So you can just say development is appropriate for age. There is no developmental delay. And how is his scholastic performance? He is studying at second standard and he is doing well. He has attained all age-appropriate milestones. Uh, correctly. So you, you need not be so elaborate in it, but examiners will ask questions related to development. Okay. Uh, so these four domains are very important. Examiners, whether it is normal or abnormal, the dietary history, immunization history, developmental history, and anthropometry is very specific for pediatrics. Okay. So definitely they will ask you questions irrespective of whether there is abnormal or normal. Okay. So you should be thorough in that. And that's why we have planned one more class this uh, coming Saturday on that four domain, four aspects alone. Okay. So coming to development, elaborate milestones in a proper sequence and not haphazardly. So very often uh, uh, they some sometimes say head control came here. They say the child started walking and suddenly you start talking about child started sitting. So there is no proper sequence many times in the presentation. So it has to be in a proper sequence 
there should not be any haphazard the milestones happen in a proper sequence so you have to also present it in the same sequence and it will be always better to elaborate milestones separately for all the four domains so you have to elaborate gross motor separately fine motor separately social milestone and language milestone okay and finally for a cp child and all uh, you have to derive the developmental quotient okay just not telling the milestones is enough you have to give your interpretation and you have to derive the developmental quotient and finally you have to say whether all the four domains are affected then it is a global developmental delay or whether any particular domain is affected then it is developmental dissociation or there is a worsening in the attained milestone then it is developmental regression mostly you will not be kept developmental regression but they will ask you what is regression so whatever attained the child loses then it is developmental regression and for almost always do not stop with just development always enquire whether your vision and hearing are normal for the child because these are the two windows of development if the hearing is abnormal the child doesn't turn to sounds then language will not be developed okay so make sure that the vision and hearing are normal you can just put a word below the development that the vision and hearing are normal because they are considered the windows of development okay i have given a small example of one domain alone okay like this you have to elaborate for all the four domains especially for a cp child okay so you have a 3 year old child uh, you have to write uh, head control start with head control it is delayed and it has attained at 8 months of age instead of the 4 months so there is no point in asking any question here uh, you you have conveyed to the examiner that you know that it has been delayed and you know the exact normal age when the head control will come okay this is how you present it would be very nice okay roll over has come at 13 months instead of the required 5 months sitting at 18 months instead of 8 months so this is how you should present and at present what is the child able to do at present he is able to walk with support which is uh, at 3 years instead of 1 uh, year the child should have done it at 1 year okay so what is a gross motor developmental quotient developmental quotient is nothing but uh, what the child has attained divided by what is the chronological age so 1 year divided by chronological 3 years into 100 so that is 33% so anything above 85% only is considered normal so you have to derive the gross motor developmental quotient similarly average of all the four developmental quotient will give you the general developmental quotient general dq so you have to derive the developmental quotient then only you will be getting good marks okay similarly after the developmental history we will be elaborating the developmental history later on on the next week of the saturday okay uh, coming to this final the socio economic history we usually say that the modified kupuswami scale where you take into education occupation per capita income and the housing conditions how uh, housing condition we don't take in kupuswami scale but you have to mention it in the socio economic history it's a bit tough scale to remember so just like growth charts you can take a print out of the socio economic uh, kupuswami scale with you if the examiner permit or else you just write down what is the education of the highest family member or especially father what is the occupation he is doing what is the per capita income per capita income is the total income divided by the total family members okay even if there is a new born you have to divide you have to include in dividing that okay per capita income and how is the housing conditions the access to good safe drinking water access to toilet and all those things you have to mention in the socio economic history so education uh, if you apply the kupuswami scale well and good have a scale with you it's not so easy to remember all this uh, final class will be upper class upper middle lower middle upper lower and lower scale okay so remember you use education occupation and income these three are taken into account okay education occupation and income okay and you give scores and classify them into upper class upper middle lower middle upper lower and lower class okay if you don't have the scale no problem just write down all the education occupation per capita income and the housing conditions okay and finally the summary of the history once you have moved on from the history you have to give a summary so make make a note of all the positive points in the history and significant negative history also you can add and finally make a 
differential diagnosis do not try to give a diagnosis straight away then examiner will ask you uh, why should we even do examination no so give a differential diagnosis give two or three diagnosis and you should be able to say which system i am going to examine based on the summary of the history okay okay now let's move on to the general physical examination or the head to toe examination so uh, when we are telling about the general physical examination first we will be starting with the general ap appearance if the child is unconscious we have to say that unconscious no, or if the child is irritable and not cooperating or not uh, something like um, um if, uh, that has to be mentioned here and in the case of if the child is very active playful cheerful unlike in the adults we will be saying like conscious cooperative those kind of words we will not be using whether the child is active playful that can, that word we will be using or if the child is already irritable and that means the sickness of the child next important thing is that if the child already had some kind of deformity or any kind of if the child is not ambulant that has to be mentioned here okay and very important in the case of general physical examination can be remembered in the pickle pneumonic pickle that is paler ictus sinuses clubbing lymphadenopathy and then edema whether the child is pale or not to be mentioned ictus sinuses clubbing lymphadenopathy if it is a generalized lymphadenopathy or the regional lymphadenopathy that has to be mentioned and you will be asked about what is the significance of all those things and you need to know the what is the significant size for example in the case of cervical it's the 1.5 cm is going to be a significant lymphadenopathy if it is smaller than that you need not even mention it's a insignificant one or another thing whether it's a generalized or the localized localized means that point to the localized infection so if it is a cervical alone then we'll be uh, checking all this um, throat examination all those things whereas if it is a generalized involving cervical and then ling inguinal uh, axillary so we need to think about all the other system that is like uh, leukemia kind of uh, illnesses where this going to produce a generalized lymphadenopathy next is edema edema is again we can say it as a pedal edema whether it's a pitting or the non pitting next for a non ambulant child the edema has to be seen in the sacral area so we say it as a sacral edema present or not so in the case of newborn we will not be seeing it's always the dependent portion as already sir said it's the the sacrum is the most dependent part so we'll be looking for the sacral edema next coming to the head to toe examination actually for any case will not be having most of the findings okay so for uh, um, maybe in the case of ct we will be having all the squint that has to be mentioned and then persistent fisting that has to be mentioned separately but uh, microcephaly if present can be mentioned and then in the anthropometry we can be it can be confirmed but in a case of uh, pneumonia or something like that where the head to toe finding will not be that much significant apart from this retractions and others so you need not mention that there is no microcephaly there is no squint so these kind of negative thing should not come here only the positive thing that whatever you are finding that has to be mentioned in your case sheet last but not the least it's very important always stand on the right side of the patient so whenever you are examining it's the you should be on the right side of the patient and be gentle to the patient and first introduce yourself ask for the permission and then you can proceed for the examination now coming to the vitals so vitals for the blood pressure will be using the age appropriate and then size appropriate size appropriate cuff to be used okay in the this is again uh, for the rs system will not be using uh, you will not be doing the all four limb uh, blood pressure examination whereas in the case of cardiovascular we it's must that all four limb bp has to be measured and told and different posture also it has to be sitting lying down whether it is taken in the standing or sitting down position or in the lying down position to be mentioned okay next important thing is that respiratory rate it has to be calculated for the complete one minute and you have to mention the type of the respiratory uh, respiration also whether it's a thoraco abdominal or the abdominothoracic next coming to the important vital that is the pulse 
so pulse we'll be elaborating as rate rhythm character volume radio femoral delay and felt in all peripheral pulses so this is actually very much important in the case of cardiovascular system and the character of the pulse can be felt in the carotid okay thank you ma'am thank you so after the general head to foot examination we go on to the anthropometry it is very important in pediatrics the anthropometry uh, i always say that uh, uh, we should not be a tailor okay you have your uh, tape and you just measure and write down so the height is uh, 100 cm height is 150 cm that any tailor can do what is required is interpretation what is the interpretation of that value what is the point in writing 5 kg 10 kg 50 cm 75 cm it doesn't serve the purpose you have to give your interpretation whether it is normal or abnormal similarly in uh, diet history also i often see the students uh, uh, telling uh, like a hotel server no the menu so what is for menu idli vada chapati puri so like that they tell in the diet history that is not important you have to calculate the calories you have to calculate the protein say whether it is normal for it age or whether there is any deficit how much is it deficit so that interpretation is very important in anthropometry and diet history okay so use growth charts to plot weight height it's very easy uh, Uh, use the iap growth charts take a print out of the iap growth charts before you come to the uh, exams and plot the weight and height find out the exact percentile where it is falling that is very important uh, task to do uh, it makes your life easier or else they will ask you whether it is abnormal or not you will be you will not be able to say whether it is abnormal or not so you have to use complex formulas they will ask you some uh, complex classifications okay so better to chart in a growth chart find out the percentile if it is less than third centile it is less than two standard deviation it is abnormal it is taken as abnormal so weight height all if it is less than third centile uh, or less than two standard deviation we take it as abnormal for head circumference alone it should be less than one centile or less than three standard deviation to Uh, diagnose uh, microcephaly so use growth charts find out the percentile and see whether it is less than third centile or not for head circumference alone it should be less than one centile and remember uh, uh, you should uh, use the term length up to 2 years followed by height then comes also remember the mid arm circumference or mid upper arm circumference it sh it should be taken only from 1 to 5 years no point in giving a mid arm circumference for a 6 year or 7 year okay it's an age independent anthropometry it has to be given between 1 to 5 years alone it should not be given even for a 6 month or 7 month old child because it is constant for 1 to 5 years okay so that is very important and uh, you have to remember the formula for weight height and uh, how does the head circumference increases they will ask you these questions often what is the weight formula for a 4 uh, year old child so you have you should be able to say sir age into 2 plus 8 is the formula for the weight similarly what is the formula for eight height you should be able to say sir age into 6 plus 77 is the formula for height don't worry the anthropometry will take it in a separate class but you have to present like this some might even expect classification like uh, iap classification and uh, who classification uh, you have to say if especially if the child is malnourished okay and systemic examination come on man yeah now coming on to the systemic examination what we have is that inspection palpation uh, for every examination inspection palpation percussion and then auscultation so uh, rather than keeping everything like uh, this is the uh, these are the set of questions that, uh, say, uh, these are the set of uh, findings that i will be seeing so this becomes a very easy crispy point so that you can fix it to any of the system so for the inspection be it whatever examination always stand on the right side of the patient which is very important introduce yourself and ask for the permission if it is a uh, uh, if you are a boy or or a male what get ask for a female attender while you are examining the female uh, patient or female child okay so first is that you need to know the symmetry so for the symmetry uh, for example in the case of respiratory it will be like uh, Uh, whether the chest, skeletal deformity is there or not, whether the chest wall asymmetry is there or not, and in the case of abdomen, he'll be saying that 
the abdomen is uniform in nature and not distended here uh, not distended anyway so that means that symmetry is maintained okay now coming to the position in the case of respiratory system we mean the tracheal position so whether it is seen midline or not okay in the case of uh, cardiovascular system we are seeing this apical impulse that is uh, the apex is seen in the normal position or not seen can be seen okay so remember for always inspection it's you are not touching the patient and you have to say that it is seen or appears to be appears to be so this term is also very important you should never use the thing uh, is present in is present in is always in the case of palpation trachea is present in midline is a palpatory finding so in the case of inspection trachea seems to be in midline a trachea appears to be in midline this is the term that we will be using so in again in the cardiovascular system we will be seeing the any bulges present or not precardial bulges present or not for any system for anything you will be seeing whether any scars and sinuses present or not and then movement movement of the respiration in the case of respiratory system and in the case of abdomen it's the if all the quadrants are equally moving with the respiration or not if in case of tenderness or something the that particular quadrant will not be moving or in case of huge mass that quadrant will not be particularly moving so that can be uh, actually extracted from the inspector finding itself next coming to the palpation all your inspection finding should be confirmed in the palpation so trachea which seen to be in, and is found that trachea the number one uh, thing is that before palpating any area especially in the case of abdominal case you should know uh, uh, the as the uh, child so that they will locate where the pain is exactly so that avoid that area and then start from a non tender area so to palpate painful area last is the dictum always in the case of respiratory system what are the palpation we use is the tractal fremitus and the movement of the respiration so whether the movement is of the chest wall is uh, equal or not can be seen and then with the tractal fremitus we can see whether the re respiratory sounds are heard equally or not or in case of consolidation there will be increased or decreased or accordingly okay in the case of abdomen what we palpate is that is there any organ enlarged or not in the case of liver enlargement we will be seeing what is the liver span also and we will be giving a detailed uh, detailed note about the liver examination whether it's a uh, nodular soft tender or not all those things has to be given similarly for the spleen and what is the size also to be said and in the case of abdomen again uh, important thing is that dilated veins if it is present in the case of inspection we will be seeing that whether it's obstructed or not and in the so next slide please ah now coming to the percussion so for the percussion uh, the thing is that for the cardiovascular system usually we will not be doing any percussion okay so in case of uh, uh, cardiac tamponade or uh, pericarditis that time only when the fluid is there or something that time we'll be knowing the cardiac borders so only in that time we'll be doing the percussion so for the ug you will not be requiring that so percussion is a matter of choice in the case of rs and the abdomen for the respiratory system we can delineate the uh, for, uh, this consolidation or pleural effusion whether it's a water or the woody consistency so can lung is consolidated or not can be delineated with this percussion direct as well as the indirect direct is actually mainly for the apical lobes whereas indirect is completely for all the areas so you will be doing in the supra mammary infra mammary and then axillary infra axillary and then supra scapular intra scapular inter scapular and then infra scapular okay so these are the areas of percussion and this will be the areas of palpation this will be the areas of uh, auscultation too now coming to the abdomen so percussion will be the presence of fluid 
in the presence of fluid will be uh, delineating how we are going to quantify how, how much ml of uh, fluid is going to be there so in the case of fluid thrill if we are getting a positive finding in the fluid thrill it's around like 2000 ml is uh, sorry uh, yeah 2 liters is going to be there whereas in the case of shifting dullness we'll be having a 1000 ml so shifting dullness and the fluid thrill these are the percussion findings in the case of abdomen if there is no ascites or nothing you can very well say that no shifting dullness or no free fluid in the abdomen that is all so when coming to auscultation <clears throat> we'll be for the respiratory system we'll be hearing for the breath sounds whether it's normal vesicular breath sounds or the bronchial breath sounds what we are, whatever we are going to get where is the area that has to be mentioned if the normal breath vesicular breath sound heard all over the chest wall is the short finding for example if i am having a cvs case and i'm just I, uh, if i'm having a cvs case i'll be elaborating everything about the cvs case and then for the respiratory abdomen you'll be saying only these two words there is normal vesicular breath sound heard no added sound if krebs are there krebs are there and if wherever is there that has to be mentioned you need not say like respiratory system inspection palpation percussion auscultation so if you are keenly looking for only one system elaborate that system and rest all system has to be given in a one word Uh, in a sentence okay so for the uh, cardiovascular system main thing that we are going to see in the auscultation is that heart sounds whether s1 is present s2 is heard or not where split is present normally pleasant or not and then it's going to be a variable or what has to be mentioned here and murmur whether it's a systolic murmur or diastolic murmur so there are few murmurs which will be best heard in the diaphragm and best heard in a few will be best heard in the bell of the stethoscope these things will be detailed uh, will be taken detail in the cvs uh, case presentation so just overall you can know that you will be giving only these stress ideas uh, you will be giving only these stress presentation so that the examiner will be impressed about that and for the abdomen it's the bubble sounds what we are hearing okay ma'am thank you ma'am and uh, cns is one uh, examination where it would be a bit different compared to the other uh, systemic examination so there will be no uh, palpation and percussion in cns so you start with higher mental functions so you ask the consciousness how is the child is the child conscious is the child oriented how is the speech is the child how is the behavior is the child irritable and how is the gait gait of the child so all these are the higher mental functions then you move on to the cranial nerve examination so you don't expect a, a methodic approach in cranial nerve examination you don't expect to do a snellens chart for the uh, acuity of vision okay uh, if the child has a pupillary light reflex fine the second nerve is good okay that's how we go for if the child is moving the eyes in all directions 3 4 6 are through okay the child has sensation pain sensation on the face fifth nerve is good corneal reflex fifth nerve is good any deviation of mouth no seventh nerve is good that's how you go you go a bit uh, uh, not as systematic as in uh, adult okay uh, you go for the reflexes for example gag reflex is good so ninth tenth are good okay this is how you go for and similarly for eighth nerve is the child turning to sounds you don't do the a proper tuning fork test for a 2 year old child okay so if the child turns to sound good eighth nerve is good that's how you go for the cranial nerve examination then comes the motor system motor system you start with the posture how is the attitude okay is it uh, totally extended or is it uh, flexed okay the posture okay what is the posture then the tone is the tone a hypotonic or hypertonic Uh, usually in cerebral palsy you get the spastic type of tone where the tone is increased then power how is the power so most often in the power the children are not cooperative to give the full 5 by 5 power so mostly they will lift the limbs above the gravity so you would be able to say definitely more than 3 by 5 but 4 by 5 5 by 5 the children may not cooperate so you have to say the best elicitable power is 3 by 5 similarly you have reflexes both superficial reflexes and deep tendon reflexes you have to mention uh, it's exaggerated in cerebral palsy okay so the reflexes are exaggerated or brisk in cerebral palsy then you have the 
superficial reflex most important superficial reflex will be your plantar reflex so usually in cp it will be upgoing so motor system consists of posture tone power reflexes before that you are going to talk about the higher function and the cranial nerve examination followed by the sensory system sensory system similarly you are not conventional to do the full sensory system at least are they responding to pain and touch how are the cerebellar signs cerebellar signs also same you are not going to do the entire uh, avenue see whether nystagmus is there give an object how is the child reaching out for the object is there any tremors while reaching out for the object is there any past pointing while reaching out for the object that much is enough for cerebellar signs look for meningeal signs see whether there is any neck rigidity okay uh, see whether there is a kernick signs and brudzinski is positive okay and finally also to assess the tone we use these maneuvers uh, specific to assess the tone like uh, pull to sit you pull the baby to make the baby sit see how the head is lagging is the head lagging too much okay hold the babies uh, with the arms in the axilla hold the baby with arms in the axilla see how is the tone similarly on ventral suspension you try to put the baby on your hands ventral suspension see how is the head is the head falling down so that assesses the tone a bit okay so pull to sit pull to sit held the arms and axilla many times when the adductor spasm is there scissoring will be visible when you hold the arms hold with the arms and the axilla and ventral suspension and finally in cerebral palsy you have to look for the primitive reflexes persistence of primitive reflexes is part of the cerebral palsy you look for moros rooting and sucking asymmetric tonic neck reflex and grasp reflex make sure they are uh, are disappearing at appropriately if they are persisting then it is probably cerebral palsy okay in addition also make sure to look into the back make sure that there is no tuft of hair which is a sign of uh, occult uh, spina bifida spina bifida occult okay so uh, at the end of the examination we will be giving the complete summary of the child which will be in a short uh, maybe two or three sentences it should be always in your medical term with a positive and relevant negative finding only so at the end of the summary we'll be giving like probable diagnosis will be so uh, i'm giving an example in the case of cvs uh, we'll be having as a uh, a child presented with uh, uh, sorry uh, for the di uh, diagnosis uh, it's a case of uh, synoptic congenital heart disease possibly a tof uh, without ph without uh, congestive cardiac failure mm, with no signs of infective endocarditis or um, and then if there is any malnutrition present or not so this will be your complete diagnosis so diagnosis will have what kind of a disease with or without complication and nutritional status for any illness we will be including that nutritional status and then any associated illness for example like this a uh, infective endocarditis is there or not or uh, ph is there or not so once the summary is over you will be given what is the diagnosis and then you will be given what is your you will be asked what is your next plan so i would like to investigate the child you will be given uh, you will be telling only the relevant investigation Uh, rather than giving us a complete profile like cbc lft rft so you should be very specific for example in the case of nephrotic or nephritic we'll be giving for rbc rbc to creatinine ratio so I, my diagnosis i got it from the history and i'm going to have a investigating about that so and then investigation that related to complication if you are finding the child is going for a complication should also be taken or if the child is having uh, for the etiology also to be done for example in the case of nephritic syndrome whether it's a uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis or any other thing apart from that that can be delineated with finding the serum complement so those things has to be the etiological factor has to be taken also next next you will be asked how are you going to treat the child 
so first your treatment again will be having everything the specific treatment and the general measures for example in the case of cerebral palsy you will not be having any specific treatment but you can say that the physiotherapy occupational therapy and then um, this uh, speech therapy all those things will contribute and you have to mention the term that multidisciplinary management is required for this case okay for in, in the case of nephrotic syndrome he will be given the steroid therapy how how am i going to give it in the form of like uh, whether it's a intensive phase or the uh, when the albumin is reduced or so he will be giving a intermittent way okay next so okay ma okay thank you ma'am thank you so hope you all uh, uh, got a revision sort of thing although it is a basic it's it's basic only kind of basic most of you would have known almost 80 percentage of this but uh, the in this area if you do blunders you know the order of presentation the haphazard way of presentation of uh, things that will uh, pull you down saying that you don't even know the basics although it is easy and say it is basics it will also pull you down when you do it wrongly so basics are uh, very important to do it the right way so hope you have understood uh, you got a birds eye view of the presentation of uh, how to do we will do further detail uh, in a case wise series okay so at least another six more live classes we are going to do uh, there we can even more better interaction we can do okay in the live classes in zoom platform we will be uh, you have an opportunity to interact with us okay from uh, jan 16th we are start starting every saturday one hour we will be discussing at least uh, 12 cases we will be discussing uh, the registration is uh, just uh, 250 rupees and you can register in this website uh, tinyurl.com www.tinyurl.com/peatsrevision peats revision you have any issues in uh, registering use this number to contact 9445482710 and uh, we are also having next saturday uh, one more class in uh, same uh, medicine channel uh, where the four important components uh, we said no very important for pediatrics we will be discussing that is on development uh, anthropometry and nutrition and immunization okay so these components we will be discussing there okay uh, and any doubts in the chat box uh, rabu uh, no sir there is no doubt sir in future there may be doubts in the live chat which will be cleared by dr balaji sir through the ch chat section in the youtube okay. if you guys have any doubt you can just put it down in the comment section which will be cleared by sir thank you so much sir for the today's okay. session it was a great start for the year so we will be having more sessions in the future and he is also starting a revision course in the month of january 16th so you can just contact him for the revision courses and you can join thank you so much sir okay and thank you ma'am for joining you. with us gayatri ma'am thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, you kavya for uh, uh, supporting us thank you raghu thank you raghu you have been uh, doing a wonderful job uh, this channel is helping out a lot uh, for the students uh, keep continuing your good work thank you thank you thank you so much sir என் பண்ணிட்டேன் சார்